Mm. Well, could someone with insider information in the foreign exchange markets profit by backing a weaker rand or a stronger rand if important news was about to break? It certainly appears that that is exactly what happened when President Jacob Zuma was recalling the former finance minister Pravin Gordon from his international investor roadshow. Better yet, did someone make money from insider knowledge? This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield, and tonight I'll talk about unusual trading in foreign exchange futures around Pravin Gordon's recall from London. Joining me via Skype from London, the man who is on top of the story is the chairman and chief researcher at Intellidex. His name is Stuart Theobald. Stuart Theobald, what do we know of currency trades at or about the time of that uh, fateful half past 10 in the morning South African time recall of Pravin Gordon from London? Uh, Bruce, the answer is not really that much. Uh, there are many different ways of trading the rand. It's one of the most traded currencies in the world. And you can trade it uh, 24 hours a day in very many locations around the world. Uh, you can trade it in the spot market. So you're buying and selling rands and dollars in real time. Or you can trade it in derivatives markets where you can buy futures or options uh, on the currency, which is a, an indirect way of gaining exposure to movements. And, and if you know in advance that something is going to dramatically affect the exchange rate, uh, you can certainly take positions in any one of those ways to profit from that, from that movement. And uh, there are substantial profits that you could make. Now, what we are able to see is fairly limited. We can look at the trades, particularly in derivatives based on the currency. And for traders in South Africa, using futures is one of the easiest, most convenient ways to gain exposure to currency movements. Uh, so I had a look at some of the volumes of trade in futures uh, on the JSE. Uh, and to my mind, you can see some unusual spikes in volumes of trades that happen, particularly in the morning that that news came out. And also a few days before that news came out, there was a substantial amount of trade. And you can also see that most of that trade, particularly on the Monday, was on the short side. So in other words, trade where positions were taken uh, against the RAND. So positions particularly uh, to in expectation of a weaker RAND. Uh, now, there are explanations that could justify this. Uh, it's possible that people were making these trades for quite different reasons. Uh, but just the volumes uh, and given the information that then entered the market, it looks to me like uh, questions should be asked about who was doing that trading. I mean, they, when it looks at the, the trend in the currency at that particular time, the RAND was breaking technical resistance levels almost on a daily basis. And at some point, there was going to be a consolidation. At some point, there was going to be at least a pause in what looked like a, a juggernaut of a currency that was strengthening day after day after day. Uh, could that not go some way to explain the positions that people were taking, that there was real concern that this currency was going in one direction too far, too fast? So that could be a plausible explanation. If that was the case, I would expect that you would see uh, generally an evenly distributed position taking. So people taking uh, small bets in various different instruments, uh, all with a view that the RAND uh, was, was overly strong and due for a correction. But that's not what you see when you look at the data. What you see is very large uh, specific trades happening in only uh, really two different futures. So you can get futures on various dates uh, and, and on various currencies as well. And when you look at the volumes, you can see that the volumes were specific to the June 2017 Rand dollar future and the December 2017 Rand dollar future. So this looks like it was just one or two individuals placing large trades rather than a generally distributed market view that was then being reflected into market movements. As somebody who's not inside the JSE, is it possible to see who was carrying out those trades? So because of uh, FICA, uh, those accounts, uh, the information of the people who are the beneficiaries of the accounts that those trades happened would be known. It would be known to the broker who placed those trades. It would also be known to the prime broker, who are the people who facilitate between the uh, the broker and the JSE. 
so that information is out there. Uh, unless you are uh, inside those brokers, you have no access to it as confidential information. But certainly if the JSE or the Financial Services Board were to investigate this as a case of uh, insider trading, uh, they would probably be able to get access to that information uh, and see whether there was a legitimate or illegitimate motive for those trades. Now, we do know that the JSE did instigate its own investigation in the days immediately after um, the recall of Pravin Gordon. They, like you, also picked up on the fact that there were unusual trades and that sparked their, their systems to instigate an investigation. What the problem with this is, is that it's a, a glacial process. It's it's got to be forensic. It's got to be absolutely accurate because anybody who's prepared to, uh, to, to crook in the finan financial markets is somebody who's going to have a team of expensive lawyers by their side. So you've got to be absolutely certain when you take information, as the JSC will, if it finds evidence, to the Financial Services Board that you've got a watershed, uh, a watershed case. Yeah, you do. Um, and the Financial Services Board will, it maintains a list of live investigations. And and on that list, it does disclose specific people it's investigating. So uh, as soon as the Financial Services Board uh, begins its process of its investigation, it will, uh, if it sticks to what it's done in the past, it will disclose you know, who it is, uh, who it suspects, uh, in its list of live investigations, and at that point, will you know that'll give us more insight. Uh, but you're absolutely right; it's a legal process. There are high standards of evidence that have to be met, uh, and the evidence has to be gathered before any kind of action is going to be taken. And you know, this is what can happen within the South African markets. But uh, there is a great deal of currency trading happening in other markets around the world, and trades in the rand. Now, if you did have advanced information uh, about uh, the, the finance ministers, you know, Gordon's, that, that information that he was being recalled from London was the thing that really triggered the movement in the currency. Now, if you had that information and you were reasonably competent uh, and understood financial uh, markets and currency markets, you could have done significantly more trade offshore and there it would be outside of the jurisdiction of any South African investigators or regulatory agencies. And, and indeed, the information would be almost impossible to find in those cases. Uh, so, you know, the, so what we're looking at here is really just a very small piece of the overall picture of foreign mm. exchange trading mm. that's happening in the world at any moment. And this just happens to be the small piece in which there is information and it does fall within the jurisdiction of South African authorities. Crucially, you also pointed to another bone of contention in financial markets right now, and that is FICA, the Financial Intelligence Centre Act. There's an amendment to that act that was on the president's desk for, the, for an inappropriate length of time before he finally found an excuse to send it back to Parliament, arguing it was unconstitutional. Parliament's uh, Financial Services Committee went through it um, and uh, removed some of the contentious issues and sent back a virtually unchanged piece of regulation to the president. That now is stuck in the president's inbox once again. A conspiracy theorist, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that I am or you are, Stuart Theobald, a conspiracy theorist, would suggest that the president is not signing that FICA legislation because inside information is, um, it's not in his interest to have inside information tracked. Well, so that bill uh, really, I mean, it's quite a, a large bill. It runs to 50 odd pages. And, but the crucial thing that it changes in the way uh, FICA legislation works is that it introduces a risk-based system to know your client requirements. So at the moment, when you and I go and open a bank account or even an account, you know, just with lawyers or an estate agent, you have to provide proof of where you live and uh, your proof of your identity and so on. A risk-based system changes that so that you have different levels of information verification you have to do for different people depending on how risky they are. So someone who is a small, uh, you know, a small depositor doesn't is not going to be transacting much money. You know, that would be a low risk person and you can actually lower the standards of oversight that you would apply to them. But conversely, somebody who is, say, uh, a, in a politically powerful position, who has the authority to make decisions that uh, 
could affect financially a lot of people, that would be a very high-risk person, and there'd be much higher due diligence you'd have to do on that client, and then ongoing monitoring of the kind of transactions that they're doing. So this amendment is really a very pro-poor amendment to this legislation, because it means that people who haven't been able to open bank accounts, for instance, because they are unable to prove where they live, banks will now be able to waive that requirement because they'd be low-risk people transacting small amounts of money. The converse but, uh, is that... So, sorry, Stuart, back, we we're yes. running short of time, but just back to the issue uh, of whether or not we can profit from insider knowledge in, in currency trades. We do know that there was some suspicion around the time that Nklanta Nene was fired, that there had been illicit trading around that time. Some of it may even have been domestic. That investigation seems to have died a soggy death, which I think points to just how difficult it is to prove a case beyond reasonable doubt against anybody who has in the intent of, of making a quick buck on foreign exchange markets. Difficult to prove a case that fits within legislation. Uh, our insider trading rules specifically say that there has to be a uh, instrument that is traded on a public market for there to be a case of insider trading. Now, if I write a contract for difference off the market, not covered. If I simply trade currency off the market, also not covered. So the fact that in this case it's futures, which is an instrument that's listed on a market, means that there's actually now jurisdiction. In previous cases, it's very hard to find jurisdiction, let alone to find the actual evidence proving that, that something illegal was done. I mean, the wheels of justice turned slowly in South Africa. The Tigon case, and you'll remember that one from many, many years ago, Stuart Theobald, is only just coming back to court, and there's no guarantee that any case is really going to be heard at this stage. This is a 15-year-old case, and this is considerably more complex and considerably more opaque. Do you ever expect to see any kind of justice done uh, around the suspicious trades in the currency markets? Well, what the FSB has its in, a, in its uh, to its advantage is that it can pursue civil remedies and fine people uh, instead of going through a whole criminal uh, legal process. And the Tigon case, I think it you know it it's a very complex criminal uh, white collar crime situation involving a lot of fraud and a lot of other things. Whereas insider trading is a fairly comparatively simple issue. If you can prove the evidence, it's, it's dealt with in a separate legal process, the FSB's own legal process, and it can levy fines, uh, which is a much neater approach. Now, many people uh, see that that is a downside as well, because often these cases you would want more than fines to be done. And that option is open. The National Prosecuting Authority can choose to make a criminal case out of things. But the FSB itself, uh, has a much neater and more straightforward way of approaching and leading to a conclusion uh, through its own civil process. The IntelliDex Chairman Stuart Theobald uh, speaking to us from London this evening here on The Money Makers. Stuart Theobald, thank you very much. Keeping an eye on unscrupulous market movements, interrogating the issues and discussing them as we do here on The Money Makers. Till next time, bye-bye.